is because if you want healing on the Holocaust, we ultimately have to let loose art on it, which does happen with the visual arts. There's much more irony applied to the Holocaust in the visual arts than there is to the literary arts. I guess because words are so precise. There's not a million ways to interpret single words. There's a certain fixation on factual truth in the written representations of the Holocaust, much less so in visual ones. And I vividly remember that when I visited Jerusalem, when I went to Yad Vashem, which is the great uh, uh, Holocaust memorial, just outside of Jerusalem. And at the end of the, of the museum, there was a gallery. And there was a, when I was there, there was a show on visual representations of the Holocaust. And, you know, one of them I remember vividly was a, um, a short clip of Hitler giving a speech. When the artist had drawn, had superimposed on Hitler giving a speech, he played with his mustache. So it went from being that thin little ugly mustache he had to being, you know, a Van Dyke, to being a, you know, a silly one, to being a full beard. He, he was mocking Hitler playing on his mustache. Um, and all the other things like that were, were like that, were, were, were very individual takes on the Holocaust. And it was extraordinarily refreshing to see that, to have a different take. I, I think we will get healing on that great tragedy once we allow ourselves to play with it, with the arts, which in no way is meant to, to disrespect it. It's not, you know, People who write about war, I mean, they disrespect war. They're just discussing it using the rules of art. And the rules of art involve a certain distancing, a certain mixing of the imagination with the facts to come to the greater truth of art. Um, you know, great art always tells the truth, not necessarily the factual truth. It's always, it's always emotionally right. It's always psychologically right, even if the facts are invented. Go back to Stephen Crane. As I said, all invented facts but psychologically, emotionally true. I was trying with Beach Universal to get to that point of healing with, um, with the Holocaust. Sorry, that was a bit of a ramble. Let me quickly, in terms of what the arts can do in a very practical way, um, Prime Minister of Canada is a man named Stephen Harper. He's like George Bush he liked. Um, <laughs> a tight, narrow conservative um, who is obsessed with economics. If the economy is doing well, everything else must follow that we're doing well, which is not the case, of course, because uh, the idea is to make the rich richer, figuring that the money will somehow trickle down, which it doesn't really. It only trickles up. You have to invest down there, and then it trickles up, like in education and stuff like that, not making the rich richer. Um, so he's your standard doctrinaire conservative, and he doesn't read. In one of the election campaigns, Prime Minister Harper was asked what his favorite book was, and believe it or not, his response was the Guinness Book of World Records. <laughs> Which, if I were a 15 year old boy, I said, yes! If I were a 51 year old man. Um, and so I decided, what can I do as a citizen of the arts about this? And I decided to send him a book every two weeks. Uh, to sort of say, you know, and the usual excuse that people who don't read give is that they don't have time. And you have to respect that. Committing to an 800 page Russian novel is a real commitment. Easier to commit to a 200 page novel. So I decided to send them short books, under 200 pages, except when they were very narratively driven. And I also sent them books in English, with exception, I sent them two in French because it has been incredible efforts to learn French. And generally, I sent them works that were relatively accessible, so not hyper experimental books that you can make sense of. And I sent him a book every two weeks with a letter explaining why he would be enriched if he read that book. And the books were all, the letters were eventually published. I had a website where I had all the letters, and eventually the letters were published as a as a as a book. And I got into trouble with that because I was accused of being elitist, that just because you read you think you're better. And I said, no, I don't. But I don't want the prime minister to have to. So for some reason, you know, just like I, I want our children to read, why well, would I want my prime minister to read? You know, is literature just entertaining? Is that all it's about? Um, no. We, you know, the best way to understand the world is through literature. Uh, you either travel to a country or you read about it in literature. And both of those ways you really get to know the country. Um, and so I did that, and I tried to be wide ranging. I, I, so I sent them <coughs> novels. Poems, plays, uh, children's stories, uh, the odd religious text, I sent him the Bhagavad Gita. Um, very, very little non fiction, because I was just defending the literary word, the, the way we invent with the word. And each 
letter would either describe the book a little bit, but often as a starting point for discussing something else. So the first book I sent him, and to me is the perfect example of what literature can do, is a book by Leo Tolstoy called The Death of Ivan Illich. And The Death of Ivan Illich is a story of Ivan Illich, who's a minor provincial judge, and one day he's putting up a curtain rod, and he slips and he bumps his side, and he gets a little bruised, but no matter. But the next day, who's is still there? And, you know, we did, oh, God, that bruise really hurts. And slowly he starts to die. He starts dying. And this, this gem of literature is about Ivan Illich's death. How he perceives his own death, how those around him relate to him. And most are extraordinary callousness. You know, his, his card friends basically say, oh, damn, you're not going to have Ivan to play cards with anymore. I'm going to find someone else. His, his, not his widow, sorry, he's not dead yet. His wife is basically concerned about her, his pension, how she will survive now that he's dying. The only person who understands what Ivan Illich is going through is a servant boy named Gerasim. He's the only one who says, Master, you are suffering. Is there anything I can do for you? And Ivan Illich discovers that if Gerasim holds his feet up in the air, oh, he feels better. So Gerasim sits there with his Ivan Illich's feet on his shoulders, and he's happy to do that. There's nothing better to do than, than comfort this man who is dying. He's the only one who, who, who understands what has happened to Ivan Illich. And it's barely 80 pages, and it's, it's uh, entertaining, it's, it's darkly funny, it's riveting reading, and you read that. And unless you're a real idiot, you are wiser for it. Because you die like Ivan Illich. Because of course, what Ray Earth does you is it pulls you out of yourself and makes you live someone else's life. So you read the death of Ivan Illich and you die with Ivan Illich. And then you resurrect and you know that much more about what it is to be alive. And I sent, um, I ended up doing this thing for four years, hoping I'd get a response from him. I never did. Um, but so the second book I sent him was Animal Farm by George Orwell. Another marvelous example of what literature can do. Animal Farm is barely 140 pages, and yet it's a marvelous encapsulation of what happened to Russia under Stalin. Most people couldn't tell anything about Stalin, when he was born, when he died exactly, the history of the Soviet Union under Stalin, you know, we vaguely have an idea that he was a bad guy, but most of us, unless we are Russian descent or have, happen to have an interest in Russian history, it's just something very vague. But anyone who's read Animal Farm understands the mechanism of what happens to the, to the Russian people under Stalin. Understand the use of coercion, of propaganda, uh, 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 of, of police brutality. Uh, it's a wonderful, it's a perfect example of what art can do. It can take all the complexity of history and reduce it to something that's simple and understandable and it's very practical. Um, so that was one. And then I was accused of being a leader, so the next book I sent was an Agatha Christie. <laughs> so I love Agatha Christie. Um, so I sent him all kinds of books. Um, in terms of, since I'm here, the Americans that I sent him, I sent him also graphic novels. I sent him Mouse by Art Spiegelman, a wonderful graphic novel about the Holocaust. I sent him, um, oh, I was touring the U.S. when a certain woman named Laura Bush and her daughter Jenna Bush published a book called Read All About It. It's, I guess, the George Bush's wife and uh, it was, was a librarian. So it's a book about reading. Funny, written by the wife of George Bush. And so I think it just came out when I was touring the U.S. about Bob and sent him Harper. Um, also, one of the collection of short stories by Juno Diaz called Drown. Um, a brilliant novel called Their Eyes Be Watching God by Zora Neale Hurston. Um, uh, one that I often refer to, The Blue Sky by Toni Morrison. There's another wonderful example of what literature does. So, The Blue Sky is, uh, is set um, somewhere in Ohio, urban Ohio, I forget what town, in the 1950s. It concerns a, a young black girl, a 12 year old girl, in a very dysfunctional family. It's very dense, not 